You have a you have quite a, a warrior spirit. I hope so. They and that's what they want to kill in us, Ray. They want to <laughs> kill our warrior spirit. And that's the thing that you can't do. You can even kill one Tiffany Cross, you can kill Teray. You can't kill a movement. Well, you that, know? Right, 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 right. And it was so right, important to me that other people knew do not be afraid. Speak your mm. truth because they want to make an example out of me. So they know the next person like, hey, when we say go do these 18 segments on Trump, you better do what we say. And I want somebody out there to know, no, I I am the power. I am my face, my brand. This is what makes up this company. If we all say it loudly enough, they can't cancel us all. The to a ratio. OK, though. The to a ratio. OK, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You's a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. Tiffany Cross is a broadcaster with a warrior's spirit. She's got a podcast now called Across Generations, produced by movie producer Will Packer. She's got a podcast with Angela Rye and Andrew Gillum called Native Lands. And she's just a force of nature in general, she spent a bunch of time at MSNBC, so I wanted to talk about that. But I want to talk about everything with her, how she became the person she is. It's all really fascinating. It's Tiffany Cross on Tour A Show. So you're a Democrat. No. No. I vote. You're an independent. I am not registered as anything because I'm in D.C. But in your mind? I vote for mostly Democratic candidates, yes. Have you ever voted for a Republican Never president? Never voted for a Republican. So Never. function, so we can say functional Democrat. Yes. You're but I'm media, just, so you don't want to go, I'm a Dem. But yes, that's not even it. I'm just not a mouthpiece for the party. No, you, know? and, and you don't have to be. You don't yeah. have to be. But and I have issues with the Democratic Party. We can absolutely be critical of the Democratic yeah. Party and still be Democrats. And I think that's valuable. But are you a Biden voter? Yes. Okay. Because that is, you know, a lot of Democrats, some Democrats are like, can't do it. Blah, blah. So why, yeah. are you, why are you a Biden voter? Um, you know, I, I think a, a big misconception about black people in particular and our party affiliation and who we vote for, um, particularly from people outside the community, they think we're so loyal to these parties, right? Which is not true. We're loyal Democrat, to ourselves. Black people are loyal to the Democratic Party. But black people are loyal to ourselves. We're not voting because we're so passionate about this party. We're voting in favor of harm reduction. And yes. so when you look at the landscape politically of what's happening, Democrats have, um, they do the least amount of harm. Yes. And so we don't have the privilege of being able to say, oh, this candidate speaks to me on all my issues yes. and they make me feel passionate about this issue. Yeah. We have to be practical voters and say, yes, this candidate will cause the least harm in my community. And when I look across the aisle, because we don't have a Republican Party anymore, it's morphed yes. into a MAGA cult. Yes. And so when I look across the aisle, this is my only option. So either I make a choice by participating in this here system and this here democracy, yeah. or I make a choice by not participating in this here democracy and hand this country over uh, to a fascist, xenophobic, yeah. misogynistic um, person whose first job in government was president of the United States, uh, who was clearly <laughs> politically and socially inept. I mean, the 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 overt racism of the modern Republican Party. I'm and like, the old Republican Party. And the old, but you, yes. Right, but I, I'm like, well, how, I, I have no, I cannot vote for you. Yeah. The like, like, do you want to have dinner with a toxic man or a serial killer? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the serial killer is completely off the table. I don't want either of these I didn't know options. we were going to be talking about my dating life here, Terrain. But, <laughs> but yes, like, the serial killer is completely yeah, a no-go. Yeah. yeah. And he likes killing black women. Like, yeah. that is absolutely not happening. The toxic man, though, like, I don't like you either, but I guess I'm stuck with you because the other, right? I mean, they're, yeah. I'm like, when people are like, oh, you're stuck in the plantation. I'm like, the Republican Party is repellent to us and not just black people, also brown people in terms yeah. of immigrants, whatever. I'm like, and women, like, I'm like, that. that is a complete uh, non-starter. But you know, when you ask people who say things like that, like, oh, you're stuck on the plantation and you start to ask them, well, what specific policies do mm -hmm. you have a challenge with? Or what are you voting on? What are your issues? And they start to tell you and you say, you reflect to them, well, the Biden presidency actually addressed this by doing X, Y, and Z. 
Um, most of these people I find are just not very informed. Um, and sometimes, and this is not a diss to them, but sometimes it's like, because you read the paper for the first time in six months and now you want to like, you know, politically debate me. It's like, you want to bumble with the B, let's have at it. I'm not trying to be like a Biden apologist or a Biden spokesperson, nothing no. like that. No. And we should, as black people, we have every right to demand as much as we can from this party. We uplift this party. We disproportionately uphold this party. That's we resurrected Joe Biden uh, in South Carolina during 2020. So, so yes, we have to make all the demands, but let's also um, be responsible citizens and be in the know. We have to get our information from reliable sources. We cannot engage in hashtag activism, hashtag voting, and hashtag information. Read an article in a reputable paper. Even cable news sometimes is bullshit, which I know we'll get into, yeah. but even that is bullshit. So it's like sometimes when you go out, you can go to websites, you can actually find what has Joe Biden done for the black agenda? What pieces of his policy speak directly to me? And oftentimes people will say, Oh, you know what? I did not know that. We also have to know the difference between um, state government, local government, and federal government because mm -hmm. sometimes people's frustrations um, are clearly based in something that they don't understand. And True. I'm again, I want to be very clear. I'm not dissing voters. I'm not dissing citizens mm -hmm. because we were kept out of this process for so long. And there are in all types of municipalities um, uh, policies in place that keep us from the ballot box. And we're also asking people to trust and believe in a system that has not served you. And so I understand the people who don't participate who say, hey, I live in this area and my kids go to a dilapidated school. My community is over policed, underprotected. Uh, I am in this red line community. You want me to trust the system that pr imprisoned my brother and poisoned my mother. And you're telling me by participating in this system, this system is going to be the thing to save me. And that is not what I'm saying as somebody who participates in civic engagement. What I'm saying is, Fuck this system. You don't have to believe in this system. We're asking you to believe in you, brother. Believe in you, sister. Believe in yourself. And what does this here democracy look like if you are its architect? What does government look like if it is by the people, of the people, and for the people, if people included you? And for so long, they've tried to convince us that we are not included in that. And mm -hmm. I'm here to say the devil is a lie. We built this place for free, as my sister Angela Rye says, mm -hmm. and we still disproportionately uphold it. So what does it say about us as patriots that we have more loyalty to this country than the people who oppressed us and imprisoned us to this day and who would put a, a traitor in the highest office of the land. So the big critique of Biden yes. is, at this moment, even on the left, mm -hmm. is what's going on in the Middle East. Yes. Palestine, Israel, Gaza. What what do you do intellectually? Because I, I imagine you are probably sympathetic to the cause of the Palestinian I, absolutely. people. Absolutely. I right. don't think you can be a human being and not be sympathetic right. to the Palestinian people so, when we see what's happening there. But, but we also see America is sending them, Israel, mm -hmm. billions of dollars that they are using to oppress a specific group of people. Yeah. Right. And that has been going on for decades. It did not start October 7th. It's mm -hmm. been going on for decades. Across administrations. Uh, right. So, but there's a lot of critique of like, but genocide Joe, right? Mm -hmm. Friends of ours would say, how dare you support? What, what, what do you do intellectually with that? Like, how do you get to, I'm voting for Biden, even though this part of what he's part of is disgusting to me. Yeah, absolutely. One, I would say, is not going to change under Donald Trump. That's right. Do not believe the devil Or Hillary is, Clinton. Or Hillary or Clinton, Clinton. Or any, no, any party. No president would have done this There is no Democratic Republican Party who is going to break loyalty with Israel. And right. we can get into global diplomacy if we want to. Uh, Israel is a nuclear-armed country. And I know we're going to get into the nuance. What we're seeing happening, I don't like when people spit in my face and try to tell me it's raining. What we are seeing happening in uh, Israel is a disgrace. In Gaza, and we're not even talking about what's happening in West Bank while people are focused on Gaza. It is a disgrace. And no matter how you feel about this issue, when you're looking at nearly 40,000 people, possibly more, nearly 40,000 people dead, most of which is women and children, you cannot tell me that this is a political issue. This is a humanitarian issue. And I have gone to uh, Israel. I've been to the region. And I have seen how the Palestinian people were treated and mm -hmm. how they live. Mm -hmm. And it should be safe for me to say 
these people have a right to exist and to freedom and safety the same way anybody else does without some hidden coalition of people trying to cancel me and suggest that I am somehow anti-Semitic because I believe in humanity. I'm happy to see that the conversation has shifted and that more people can say this out loud, including many members of the Jewish community, including Mm -hmm. people uh, who are not Palestinian. We don't have to be uh, an oppressed people. But you're critical of what America 100%. in this moment is doing there. I've always been critical right. of what America is doing there. And yet you're there. saying, I'll vote for Biden. A lot of people are having a hard time Well, this is your option. You can vote for Donald Trump, who the policy towards Israel will not change under him. Right, right. You can vote for Joe Biden and make your voice heard and continue to protest and take it to the streets and let this administration know we do not support this policy. Netanyahu does not run our government. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Israel cannot continue to do these things unchecked with us writing the check for it. That's unacceptable. Or I can make a choice and stay home and do nothing. How does that support the Palestinian people? Mm. What what is my other option? Mm, not voting does not help it, them. You are making a choice by not making a choice. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the government's going to function regardless. It will go on and continue with or without you. Mm-hmm. You can either impact politics or you can have politics impact you. I mean, you know, this is an incredibly important issue, what's going on there. Also, you will probably never encounter a significant politician here like, I agree with everything right. that they're about. Right. right. And if you agree with three, four, three, like your three, four major issues and you're aligned with them on that. Yeah. But like, this is not one of my major issues, but yeah. we're the misaligned on this. Like, I, you know, I got to roll with this. Yeah. Right. Like we are aligned on most things. Right. I, I, I wasn't aligned with Bill Clinton on everything. I was not aligned with Barack Obama on everything. Yeah. But like, you know, Hillary, but like. You know, most things, it was enough. And, of course, and then the other choice is a serial killer. Right. So, exactly. So like. Exactly. But that, that goes to my point. We don't have that kind of privilege. And I think a lot of people, and this is understandable to younger generations, um, for us, Tere, President Obama was historic. It was earth-shattering. Yeah. It was changing. It changed our concept. It captured our imagination in a way yeah. that we had never before seen in this country. For the people behind us, President Obama was the floor, not the ceiling. And they would look at some of his policies and say, oh, he should have gone further. He should have done this. Uh, So I completely understand people pushing. We looked at Bill Clinton with starry eyes. like Playing the sax on Arsenio Hall. We finally got our black president. Exactly. And the millennials. He was not a black president, but yes. Right, but that's what we thought of it. People, yeah, he was the closest thing that we had seen, a white man with a little bit of soul. This is the thing of like, when a white man can dance a little bit, we're like, he can come to the cookout. And Bill Clinton was like that kind of guy. And the younger folks are like, fuck Bill Clinton, it's the floor. We can do yeah. much better than that. Yeah. I Look, I, I think that's a, a legitimate point. Um, I remember people, I can't remember who the first person was. Was it Toni Morrison who, who called yes, the first person? Yes, she McCall? did. I thought so. She did. Who called him the In first the black president. Yeah. yeah, I do recall that. Um, look, I- But I, I remember um, hearing that the former mayor of D.C., a black woman, said that, was saying that, like, you know, maybe we don't know who his dad is. Maybe he is half black. Like people were whispering that, like maybe he is half black. It kind of reflects how sad it is in this country, right? Like all we were so desperate for someone to see us Mm. and recognize our (laughs) humanity that we were willing to adopt this man (laughs) into a culture that he could certainly be a guest of, but he was not a member of, you know? Um, I mean, there were some policies that were damaging during the Clinton era, Um, But they were less damaging, to my point about political parties, than the Bush era. When you look at what happened, I mean, Bush had given us mandatory minimums. You know, uh, during the Bush administration, we saw um, things happening that ran contrary to our beliefs and our humanity. You know, um, we saw mass incarceration rise. Um, So I get why people saw this Clinton era as like, oh, and he's going on Arsenio Hall and wearing sunglasses and playing the sax and like, what a big deal. And I remember at the time, George Bush would not go on Arsenio Hall. And he had just had some sort of heart issue. And I remember Arsenio went on this whole thing. It was like, don't nobody want your irregular heart beating self on our... And that was like all we needed. That was enough. However, we're a little more politically sophisticated now. And And now we have information at our fingertips. Now we can, you know, look at our phones and see where somebody stands on something. Now we have social media, um, which is not always the most reliable source of information, but we're being beat over the head with messaging and, you know, ads have changed and all those things. So So I see why that happened. Um, But 
Obama changed the game. Here's what I want to say about that. Bill Clinton was a great president. And at the time we thought this guy Clinton, like he's amazing. Obama came and completely changed the game. Totally. What I would tell people is um, you typically get a great president like that once in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Everybody is not going to give you goosebumps like the no, no. oratory well, of a Baptist well, you mean, minister. Uh, well, you mean a beloved, charismatic president, right? Like I voted for Biden with my brain. Right. right? I voted for Obama with my heart. I voted for Obama with my brain and my heart. I, right. I thought like he was that great. But you think about like you didn't get eight John F. Kennedys back to back to back. No. You know, even Ronald Reagan, you know, his policies were certainly des- just as damaging to the black community, but he was the great communicator. Oh, he was literally him. an actor. You know, you could spoon feed him a line and he would give it back to you. And America loved that about him. Black America understood Reaganomics and all the other things that mm. were horrible for us. But he was still there were a lot of people who, who connected with him. Bill Clinton gave us that until we saw President Obama. So some people want Joe Biden to show up and give you those same kind no. of goosebumps. And you're possible. not going to get that. They not want possible. their presidential candidates to be somebody who they want to kick it with. They want to hear from. It's like, oh, this is like church on Sunday mornings. And you will not get that. No. You don't always get to vote with your heart. No. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. The most important relationship in your life is your relationship with yourself. Are you your own best friend supporting you? Or do you criticize yourself and limit yourself? Do you have toxic habits you want to escape? Therapy can be an amazing place to work on yourself and become a better version of yourself. You really should learn how to speak to yourself in a loving, supportive way and maybe uproot some of the moments from your past that still bother you deep down. If you think you might want to give therapy a try, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, it's convenient to your schedule, and it could make you feel better about yourself and make your life better. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Torre today and get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. So let's explore the other side. One day, children (coughs) will ask you. Yes. Because you know about politics, right? Like, So this guy was under indictment for trying to steal the government, raping somebody, mm-hmm. all sorts of uh, embezzling, not embezzling, but like basically stealing hundreds of millions of dollars mm-hmm. after a presidency that was probably pretty horrible, right? Years of COVID and quarantine and incompetence. And yet the country was almost dying to reelect him. Mm-hmm. How, like, how would you explain to the next generation, like when the dust settles, like how would you explain them? Like, so this is why we were at that point. Well, let me just say, I hope that there is shock and surprise <laughs> that people are saying, what, how did this happen? Cause right now I don't know how many people are shocked and surprised by that. You know, I would say watch whiteness work. Like this is what the country does. <laughs> But, you know, we're looking at a future, and this is a a part of why we're seeing this increasing uh, overt divide in our country. We're looking at a future where there is no racial majority. By 2040, there will be no racial majority in this country. And there is a pocket of, of conservative white folks who are terrified of this. And you ask the question, this isn't mine. People have been asking this question for a while. Why are you afraid of being a minority? Do we... Treat minorities different in this country? Why would you be so afraid of this? Yes, we do. And so they think in their minds, they can convince their millions of followers if you let Joe Biden get reelected, because it's not totally about Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. It is about the vice president. If Joe Biden should die in office, you will have this black woman running the country. And we can't have that because the second that happens, they're going to reinstate white slavery. <laughs> and we are we are going to be on the bottom and they are going to be on the top. So, that is literally their fear. So I said reinstate. Is, that never happened. So there this was no is white slavery. whiteness backlash from fragility and fear of losing power. Yeah. That overpowers He's a horrible person towards women. He's a horrible person they toward his care. business. He's a horrible person toward the government. They don't care. That That is not they their really issue. They really don't. They don't. And the other lie that people like to tell is like these are, you know, poor white people voting against their not interests. Always. That's not true. He mm-hmm. reaches white folks across every demographic. Yeah. All these little clips they show of black people saying blacks are Trumps and all that. Stop talking to me about black folks voting for Trump. Let's talk about the conservative white folks. The 75 million people yes. who continue to vote for this man while he has 91 indictments. But are we black people less 
are we less angry about Trump than we were previously? No, I no. think um, I think black people fully understand this is not the first racist white man that we have survived in mm. the Oval Office. Mm. Donald Trump is a problem. Don't get me wrong. Ronald Reagan was a problem. George W. Bush was a problem. George H. W. Bush was a problem. Mm -hmm. They may have been more articulate with their rhetoric. Their <laughs> policies were just as damaging. And mm -hmm. so there had this is the only Republican Party I have ever known. The switch in their policies happened over a century ago. So anytime somebody says, oh, you know, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican or all these parties they want to throw out, that was forever ago. This party in our entire lifetime and even predating us has always been a party to look out, protect, uh, and empower uh, white people, which is why um, it, it's baffling sometimes with the Democratic Party. You don't have... Um, they still try to appeal to white voters. Mm -hmm. And the Democratic Party has not won uh, a majority of the white vote since the 60s. Mm -hmm. Those people left you a long time ago. The Republicans are clear. We can tap into white fear and that will elevate us to power. White women sit at the right hand of power. And so it makes me very nervous that we have to look to white women to see how are y'all going to move with all the repro on the ballot are you going to stand in your own interests? And I really think they they shot themselves in the foot. They fucked up. when It's like that scene in Minnesota Society where you're looking at the Republican Party. You know you done fucked up, don't you? When ah! you went one step too far with the Dobbs decision in the Supreme Court and uh, overturned uh, Roe v. Wade, and we've seen the damage of that. That will disproportionately impact women of color, but white women will be damaged from that too. So we are, are hoping— Are white women going to vote? Like Roe took something away from them and their daughters? I hope so. We'll see. I'll tell you, I'm not completely— um, Are we seeing that in the data now or not yet? No. I, I will tell you, in uh, Georgia, I believe, in 2016, mm. um, Republican governor there, Brian Kemp, a Trump acolyte, essentially, yeah. um, he was running a very anti-choice rhetoric. Uh, I don't use the term pro-life, and I hope nobody uses that no, term no. because that's not what they are. But no, the anti-choice anti rhetoric, correct. right, exactly. And the um, white women there outpaced even white men in their support for him while he was on the stump talking about taking away uh, a woman's right to choose. So, but this is the Bible Belt of the country, you know, the deep red uh, pocket of, uh, of the South in, in Georgia. People mm. think Atlanta is like Atlanta is the blue spot. It's a, a lot of red around it's, it. But Georgia's a purple state now, and, and it's yes. changed. Yes. The demographics have changed. So I, like I said, I, I, uh, you know, the Pussy Hat Coalition uh, was was eight years ago. Um, I, I'm waiting to see how they show up this election ballot. Mm. I, I'm I'm hopeful, but cautious. I'm cautiously optimistic. So I want to talk about MSNBC because we both yes. worked there. I think we both had. How was your experience there, Tere? I mean, <laughs> you know, partly it was extraordinary, and I look back at it as in some ways, the best job that I ever had. Yeah. Um, and transformative in some ways. And quite, I mean, you know, it's quite a thrill mm -hmm. to go out and have meaningful conversations in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the demo. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe a couple million in the raw number. But yeah. if you look at the demo, like, it was thrilling. Yeah. Um, I also feel like it taught me to talk about politics with a certain language that is irrelevant outside of the specific bubble of we're doing horse racy coverage of the race. Right, right. And I'm like, I hate and, it. right. I never talk like that or think like that outside of sitting there and doing that and yeah. leaving there. I'm like, that was not, that's not an effective way uh, to talk to America so they understand what's going on. Right? right, It's not a horse race. We should not be talking about, oh, it's a gaffe. Is he going to go down? Oh, he spoke to UAW. He's yeah. going to go up. He was endorsed by the They're never talking to us. No, but I mean, it's not talking to America yeah, in an right. They're not way. even talking to America. I don't mean us by black people. I mean us gin pop. Uh, America, you know? They're yes. never talking Romney to us. ate a cookie and he insulted the baker it's so, so he's going to lose two points in nebraska like it's incestuous no, yeah. it's a very incestuous space they're talking to each other yeah. the beltway press is talking to other members of the beltway press but so how did it start how did you get hired well, I used to, people thought I worked there before I did. I used yeah, to do the, the network all the time for free, though. They didn't pay me yeah, shit when I was right. on there doing commentary. And you were Scarborough a lot. 
in the morning, Morning Joe. No, I didn't. I only did Joe, Morning Joe maybe two or three times. Okay. Uh, Joy, Joy Reed. Uh, you AM remember? Joy. Yes, AM Joy when she had her weekend show, which completely outrated Morning Joe. I mean, like significantly outrated Morning Joe. Um, it was a thrill for me to be invited to do Joy's show. Um, Joy and I became fast friends. We were cut from the same cloth. We had a lot of friends in common. Um, and Joy always uh, thought that I should be her predecessor. Her um, follower. The same with, with yeah. um, Melissa Harris Perry yes. and Joy. Yes. Um, and so I used to do the show all the time. Yeah. And then other shows would in- invite me to do the show until I would say something that, you know, made white America uncomfortable. And they were like, oh, you better go do the Negro section on the weekends because we can't have that. And so that was like the, the mainstay. Um, and then they went I remember, through. I'm sorry. I remember <laughs> once I was on with Kpart and Karen Finney. I forget what we were talking about. It was a Dylan Radigan show. And I said, um, you know, all that's just about white supremacy. And we hardly ever used that term at that time. Yeah. And as soon as I said that, it came rap. <laughs> like, we're done with this segment. Get, him, get us out of here. Isn't that crazy? Like, that's so insane. <laughs> but that's part of the problem. Like, we are often the first to say it. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I remember I was considered a controversial guest because I would say Donald Trump is a bigot. Can you imagine, you know, that this was something controversial to say when that's we crazy. clearly saw this? It yeah. was so obvious to all of us. I mean, from day but it one. Was, right. But if it made them uncomfortable, then we couldn't say it. And I, I was never, I was never so thirsty to be on TV that mm. I would abandon my community. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah. here to either tell a truth that you will accept yeah. or I don't have to play in this sandbox. I yeah. will find someplace else to go. Yeah. Um, so I always maintain that. Um, and then they, when Joy became, you know, first black woman to move to primetime and host this show, um, they had what a, somewhat of an audition process. Yeah. And so uh, it was between me, Jonathan Capehart, and a uh, wonderful host, Lena Maxwell, who is still doing stuff on on radio. So um, shout out to her. But um, they decided to split up the weekend, even though it was a space that had been for black women. They decided to give Jonathan Sunday Sunday. and me Saturday. Uh, And so I was thrilled with with the platform. You're going to host the Saturday show on MS. That's big. Yeah. Yeah. But you had, I don't know what word you want to use to call it. You had um, a moment with Scarborough. Right? Because you challenged him? Yeah. So a lot of what we're talking about, Joe, um, you know, I remember Joe Scarborough as a Republican member of Congress. I remember Joe Scarborough during the Trump, um, leading up to the Trump election, uh, where he and Mika invited Donald Trump on that show all the time. Try to find those clips. You can't find them. They've been scrubbed clean. Yeah, they've been scrubbed. But we remember as viewers, I remember that. I remember Joe admonishing Black Lives Matter. I remember him basically saying this whole hands up, don't shoot is a lie. I remember all of these things about him. No problem. I have to deal with problematic white men all the time. I'm happy to sit on set and I, you know, can disagree with you respectfully. I'm not so brittle a spirit that I can't sit across from somebody um, who disagrees with me. And so Joe uh, started saying that um, the he doesn't want this country run by leftists. Look at what's happening in Portland. This was during the height of like Black Lives Matter and like some of these lefty cities were, you know, it was a lot of unrest in the country. And um, he was saying Donald Trump turned the party racist and Republicans, you have to get it together. So to me, as a black woman, I was just really surprised to hear that, because like I said, this is the only Republican Party I've known. Right. And this is the only Republican Party I've known you to be a part of. Right. And so for you at this point to say Donald Trump turned the party racist. No, nah, my brother, this Barry, party didn't been Barry racist. Barry Goldwater on line one. Thank you. Richard Nixon Thank on you. line two. And again, you want to bumble with the B and go through history? I'm happy to go toe to toe with you and talk about it. Again, I'm not so brittle a spirit. You know, yes. um, I, I cannot say the same for my, my Take a step partner. back because was MSNBC your first time having a lot of television? No, I used to do CNN. I even did Fox. I used to go on Fox. Uh, but like when lot. you're at MS, you're doing a lot of unpaid stuff. Yeah, uh, nobody paid me anything. Right. I was always unpaid. And it's in the back of your mind. If this keeps rolling, I could become a contributor. That was never in the back of my mind. Really? When I was on set, I was only there to speak a truth. I was only there to represent uh, my community. Yeah. Um, I never chased a viral moment. I never chased a contributorship. I never chased having a show. Okay. Those things, you know, it was an organic thing that happened with me, but that was not my goal at all. Okay. Uh, I had worked behind the scenes in television for years, um, I don't know if you remember, you and I worked together at BET. 
Uh, I'm with Selwyn Hines, yeah, yeah, who was yeah, there. Yeah. We used to have meetings together. And yeah. I honestly, Trey, I'll tell you this. I thought it was so cool that I got to work with you. <laughs> um, this was like 2006 oh, or seven, And I remember we were all, Selwyn didn't like conference rooms. And we were all yeah. like crowded in, in his crowded, office. Yeah, yeah. And I was telling you guys I had seen Color Purple. And you were like, so Mr. is good now? I don't get it. Oh, the I remember play. Like, oh, I hated the <laughs> yes, play. I remember. Oh, I, hated the play. I remember us talking about it. Oh, my God. But my point is I was an executive producer. I was a producer, a field producer, long before I ever got in front of the camera. The, there's there's there is a potential nervousness that one might feel when you're a repeated guest yeah. on a show. And I'm not talking about the stage fright, right? Yeah. I'm talking about if I say what I really think, are they gonna say I never Don't had that come filter. Back. I never had that filter. Why not? I, well, because what would it gain me to have this seat at this table? And not um, and and stand just for myself and not stand mm. for my people because mm. corporate America, um, corporate media particularly can reject me. Yeah. They're a fickle bunch. Yes. I can be their favorite person or yes. their worst nightmare with just like that. Yeah, my community will always be there for me. I am in the community. I am of the community. I owe a debt to black folks for sure. Um, I my goal, my mission in life because I'm mission driven has always been to live in service to black folks. My mission has always been in whatever aspect I'm working or doing to work and fight for the equality and liberation of black folks. Where does this come from in you? Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me how I, I develop my worldview, and I don't know if this developed my worldview because it happened over time, yeah. but I remember being really young, and the first book I read, read rather, was a book of poetry called Golden Slippers. Okay. And it was all the Harlem Renaissance people. So County Cullen, uh -huh. Langston Hughes, yeah, yeah. Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Yeah, I would yeah. memorize these poems. And what they said made so much sense to me. And I was so incensed at what they had gone through. And I remember um, reading uh, I Too Sing America. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, but why would they send him to eat in the kitchen? You know, mm. why does the darker brother have to go to the kitchen? Doesn't make I remember sense. It didn't make sense to me. Um, and I remember reading like Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and watching films. And remember after school specials, ABC sure. after school? Yeah. Sure. And they would do these after school specials where it was like a slave movie and I would see it. I remember watching Roots. Um, I remember watching, uh, I'm 45. So I, I was younger when A Different World came out. And I remember hearing Dorothy Hyde. And it's like, oh, I want to read about who this woman Dorothy Hyde is. Yeah. And I remember watching like this black excellence and beauty and thinking I want to be a part of that. And I remember like, seven, eight years old thing, and I was born at the wrong time. I should have been born <laughs> during the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. This is my era. Okay. I love to write. I love to read. That's like, yeah, these are my people. This was my posse. And so from that was probably the first seed that that began to blossom in me. And then as I grew and read more and learned more and listened more than I spoke and learned how to listen more than I speak, um, yeah, I became increasingly more curious. Okay but also more passionate and that I knew I could not just live a good life, but I had to live a life of service. Interesting. I mean, I, I feel that too, in that I have to do something that honors the people who came before me, mm -hmm. who fought, who lived, who died so that we could have these opportunities. Yeah. Um, so did you say something to Scarborough that led to him going to Phil Griffin and saying, don't, Yes. Don't don't elevate her. Yes. What was that? He, um, everything wow, I said. Petty. How yeah. petty! An unpaid contributor. Yeah. Trying to come up. Yeah. He's the multi-billion-dollar host of the morning show for years and years, and he's like in Phil Griffin's office. Don't elevate her. Like, Are you surprised at that? Though? Like I feel like we face so much shit as black folks. Somebody sitting on my set is not going to shake me at all. But if I'm a brittle spirit ass person like that, then yes, that, that can shake me. If somebody spoke a truth that made me feel uncomfortable, yeah. that could shake me. And I think a, like a hard day for them yeah. is like what we call a Tuesday. Right, right, it's right. It's like right, you're right. ilk. You don't believe in yourself enough. That's why you like the level. You don't like a level playing field. You want it to be lopsided because you don't trust yourself enough. And something about me that looks at that unlevel playing field and say, now watch me leapfrog over yeah. all of these motherfuckers right now yeah. and get to where I'm going. Yeah. They don't like that. And he, I would say that he um, was, was kind of that person. I don't have a problem with Joe Scarborough. You are exactly who I expect you to be. I know exactly who you are. So but it's no problem. he stabbed you in the back. He didn't stab me in the back. <laughs> 
he he did what he does. He did what he knows how to do. Andrew uh, Gillum gave me a great quote that don't expect a hyena to act like a lion. You are the person who I believe you to be. So I wasn't surprised. I wasn't shook. So yes. how did you get from Joe yeah. saying, don't elevate her to Phil still saying, no, I'm going to put her on Saturdays, which Phil, is a big yeah. decision. Phil reported to Cesar Conde. I think... Caesar was business savvy. You know, Caesar was um, somebody who understood all aspects of television. He wasn't the Weather Channel girl. He was somebody who had worked at the executive level, uh, you know, in, in many areas uh, and, and understood. He saw the value in Tiffany. Cross. Yes. And he got to know me like we had conversation and I wasn't shy about my positions. I was clear. I had a vision Wait, for the show. What was your vision? Well, I wanted to create a show that centered the rising majority of America. Just like you, I saw what was happening in cable news, and it was a very incestuous business. The Beltway media talked only to each other. Mm -hmm. And so they would say these things like, well, you know, the COB came out and said, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to go over to so-and-so, our correspondent at the DOJ. And it's like, wait a second, guys, slow down. What is the COB? You know? Or, or CBO, rather. What is the CBO? What is that? What does that mean? What is the DLJ? That might seem common to you. Of course, everybody knows the Department of Justice. Not everybody watching does. And so when I'm watching that, I feel like you're not speaking to me. Mm. You're not informing me. Mm. You're just talking this highbrow speak. After being uh, in politics and media and broadcast for 20 plus years, I understood how to do that and how to do it seamlessly. And so everybody who came on my show was either a person of color or someone who could speak intelligently about an issue that impacted people of color. Mm. And that was the rising majority. It baffled me that so many other platforms centered a shrinking majority. The average cable news viewer is a 62 to 65-year-old white man. Older well, than that for some. For some. For Fox, it's older than Precisely. that. Precisely. Yeah. So to me, it's just business savvy to understand those people are not immortal. And we have a whole group of people here who are summarily ignored by this platform. And with streaming that could come and yank the entire cable news industry off a cliff that we see that happening now. Why would we not speak to this emerging audience? Why would we not tell people of the AAPI community, fastest growing demographic in this country, people in the Latino community, largest voting block uh, in terms of eligible voters, not registered voters, largest voting block in Latino, uh, the Latino community, the indigenous community who we never hear from. And of course, the black community who disproportionately uphold, upholds this democracy. Why would we not have a show mm -hmm. where those voices and perspectives are centered? And it simply did not exist. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I were going to have that show, it would have to be a place where truth is spoken. It was not a show exclusively for these people. Everyone should have curiosity about their fellow country. So I invited everyone to come and be a part of this conversation, but these topics would focus on these particular communities, and the communities responded in kind. We were the highest rated show on the weekend. We, again, like Joy did, outrated uh, Morning Joe. We um, averaged 4.6 million viewers a month. We were successful. We were wholly successful. So How? I say you have an eye for talent because when you have a successful show, you want to empower that show. You want to expand it unless... You are um, you are inept when it comes to running an operation like that. This isn't I, honestly. I really mean this. Like I don't have any personal ill will towards anybody. My life is going on just fine. It sure has. Yeah. So it, it's not that. But just looking back at it, there were issues where it felt like, oh, I think you might want to be the superstar. You know, like I think you. There's some level of jealousy here when I had so much respect for the executive brass. And we have to normalize the leadership of black women. That's something that spoke very dear to me. And so I always wanted to do that. Um, but unfortunately, it was an environment where that wasn't really welcome. <laughs> being a guest and being a host are very different. Very different. And you made a pretty seamless transition into being a host. I mean, everything about hosting is different. Yeah, very different. Talk about making that transition. Well, again, you have to listen more than you speak. Mm -hmm. And what people don't know is you have something called an IFB in your ear. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you have um, a director who might talk to you. You have your executive producer who might talk to you. You have your booker who might talk to you. And the entire time, you have to be listening to what the guest is saying. All you see is this face right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have to listen to everything Teray is saying while I also have my EP saying, 
hey, we need to get out of this ASAP. There's breaking news out of Ukraine. To, or, or even if there's no breaking news, 30 seconds left. Right. I got to shut you up within yes. 30 seconds. Yes. It, like hook or crook. We got to We got a hard break right? in 30 seconds. And maybe Teray just said something like, I'd actually like to make this major announcement on your show right now. Like go. you are juggling so many things throw and to, it has to be seamless. Throw to the clip. Yeah. Throw to the, the picture that we picked before. Yeah. So there's a lot of things going on. and there's Or also, you're coming back from a break yeah. and you're like, all right, everybody joining us now. We have Teray, he's the host of this amazing podcast. And they say, Teray's uh, satellite just went down. We just lost Teray. Oh my God. So now I got a six minute block of television <laughs> with no guests. And it's live TV. <laughs> like I have to be well, no, even. Did you? Did you have to? How often did you have to do live? Live? Like I was live every week. No, 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 no. Live is I'm looking at a prompter, talking about the stuff that we planned that we would talk yeah. about. And then every once in a while. Breaking news happens while you're on the air. Monthly. Kill the prompter. Yeah. Li- I mean, like, live, live. Like, we yeah. are we are making it up as we go along. I, on average, I'd say once a month yeah. there was something that would happen. And that I was— I liked it. It was. It gave me, it like, terrifying. adrenaline. It wasn't terrifying. <laughs> it was adrenaline. I got better at it mm-hmm. because there were so many things I'd want to say, especially if you're watching a press conference in real time. Mm-hmm. And then you have to come out of that and recap for the audience. Mm-hmm. This is what we just heard. And then you have to make it make sense. And you have no idea who your guests are. Your bookers are working to get somebody— when uh, the Boston Marathon bombing happened, yeah, we were on. Wow, three oh eight. Yeah, they're like something happened at the Boston Marathon, killed the rest of the show. We're you know, but then we're throwing to somebody in Boston, right? When Joan Rivers died mm. at three twelve, and I'm sitting here with three people who I love who knew nothing about Joan Rivers. Oh wow, nothing, yeah. and they're like. Torre. Yeah. <laughs> we have 45 minutes to kill on yeah. Joan Rivers. You're the only person who knows about her. Say as much as you want. <laughs> but your bookers are frantic trying They're to find frantic somebody. And they got talk. Rahima yeah. Ellis and they got, you know, but like, again, I'm coming up with questions off the top of my head yeah. to talk to them about J- Joan Rivers. My, my co host, that's not their area. Yeah. And I had just happened to watch a documentary about her and I watched her on, uh, she was on Louis C.K.'s show. I'm like, I am up on Joan Rivers. Yeah. Just happened, but, but like, to do live discussion of Joan Rivers for 40 Yeah, years. yeah. So, so you're loving the show, but then. What happened with Tucker Carlson? Oh, yeah, Tucker, because I was speaking this truth, Tucker Carlson, who I used to work with him. He doesn't remember this either, but I was uh, an associate producer at CNN, and um, I used to fill in on Crossfire sometimes, like pulling their research. Yeah, Yeah. when it was he and Paul Pagala. Um, And he used to be a guest on other shows. I used to do Capital Gang for anybody who was like a political nerd 20 years ago Uh watching these kind of shows. Um, But Tucker Carlson saw my content and was grossly offended by it. Um, he works at Fox News and was grossly offended by what I was saying. And he started making an issue of it and um, started making me a character in his show. Um, and he dedicated, I think, 13, maybe 17 minutes of the opening of his show one night to me to talk about how problematic I was. Um, I, obviously, I don't watch Tucker Carlson, but I started getting flooded with all this like you, hate mail and no. comments and yeah. this crazy shit happened. People were calling my phone and hanging up. Like I had no idea what was going on. Um, and he tried to say I was trying to start a race war. Tucker Carlson tried to say I, Tiffany Cross, am starting a race what does war. That even mean? And um, yeah, and just it, it became a, a whole thing. And the network did not check with me to see if I'm okay. They didn't say how you feeling. Do you know? Do you need security? Anything like that? There's somebody who ran security who did check in with me, but the network itself never came to my defense. They never said anything, and um, they instructed me that I could not even mention Tucker Carlson's name. They on my specifically show. was Caesar or Phil. No, this was um, all um, from like the people who immediately oversaw the weekend show. Your EP. Well, uh, it was communicated to my executive producer and me um, from the, the management team. Of, that, the we- of the week. That mm-hmm. you were not to respond to Tucker. I was not to respond to Tucker, nor could I even say his name on my show. I couldn't play a soundbite from him. I could not reference him at now, all. No, that is not totally out of keeping with what had been happening. Because mm-hmm. I was there at a period when the incoming from Fox was insane. They were attacking Martin Bashir. Like, we are trying to get him kicked off the air. Yeah. They were attacking Melissa Harris-Perry. Like, we want to get her off the air. Yeah. Um, they attacked Ed. Like, we, you know, so it was like, we are coming for your job. Yeah. And the general, I mean, I remember Bashir didn't listen. And he kept 
doing clips and pushing back. But they were like, don't feed the trolls, mm-hmm. right? They didn't say that. But it was like, don't fight. So there was kind of like the institutional mindset of like, do, we don't want the, because I mean, we're not the same as them. Right. They're doing yeah. a, a political entertainment. Yeah. We are trying to do actual news. We should not write. We, I think, look, I think there's some. Um, but you were told. Don't respond, yeah. right? which is which is what they've been saying for years. Yeah, but this I, I bothered think you. It didn't. I didn't do it. It didn't bother me. Um, there are plenty of things to talk about. I didn't have to respond to Tucker Carlson. Um, there are thousands of things that happen in the world every day. I read eight papers before the sun comes up. You tell me I can't talk you about do. Tucker Carlson? No problem. There are so many other more relevant things to me. What bothered me is that the network did not extend me any courtesy or safety. Um, and they did not approach me with, we're sorry this happened to you. How can we support you? They approached me with admonishment that somehow I had invited this and now you cannot even respond. They thought it was your fault? They never said this is your fault, but nobody said, hey, we're so sorry. How can we support you here? You know, what can we do? It was just, do not say anything about Tucker. Don't respond. Um, it was like a, a child who, who broke curfew. I just, I didn't like it at all. But again, I wasn't expecting hyenas to act like lions. <laughs> right, I was the person, right. like I can fight my own battles. You know, I wasn't afraid. I didn't have any fear. I didn't need security. I'm like, he is real. Twitter fingers is real tough and sitting behind an anchor desk, but don't let this Saturday morning anchor here fool you. Like if I feel like my life is, is threatened, I know how to defend myself. So you tell me I can't trade barbs with this half witted asinine racist idiot. No problem. Forget it. I, okay. I didn't plan on it anyway. So the world continues. Let, let me pause you for one. This this we're, we're going to go off the show for a second. It's six oh two. I have way more than eight minutes left of stuff. Can, can I? You, um, can I like? I will like Uber you to the train okay, okay. and like. Let's go. Let's go. Let's um, do it. Um, so because I want to talk about my new show. But no, no, we'll we'll get, okay. we'll get. I mean, this is this is important to me because this is okay. But this, I mean, this is like part of my life, my hope. Like we're yeah. So okay, we will come back on. Um, so, do you think it was the Charlemagne thing that why my why my show was canceled? Yeah, I have no idea. No one has ever told me this. Well, what is do why. you think? Uh I <laughs> I think because um, I have a theory. Oh, well, tell me. Your no, no, theory. I want to hear your idea. Well, I think it was, it felt to me very personal. Okay. Um, and it happened to align with a lot of right wing, because it wasn't just Tucker Carlson. It was also Megyn Kelly, um, Bill O'Reilly. Like, there were a lot of loud conservative voices who found me problematic. Yeah. Um, and Bill O'Reilly wasn't even at Fox anymore. He was, like, on some little platform, <laughs> but he would, like, do these essays about me. Got kicked me. off. Yeah. Um, and... I just think it made the network uncomfortable. I think there were things that I said that they found controversial, which for millions of people across the country, I would love to say I'm just that brilliant and I was saying all these things on my own. Um, What they didn't necessarily understand is millions of people across the country have already said this. They've already thought it. They're talking about it right now. And the reason why they tune into this show is because I am boldly saying the things that we talk about in our group chats, that we talk about at book clubs, that we talk about over Sunday brunch, um, that we toast to. And so I, my mission was never to make white people comfortable. My mission was also not to make white people uncomfortable. I did not anything them. I did not think about them. I was speaking to a growing demographic, and I knew and trusted that if I did that, white people would still come. I knew there were enough people out there with enough curiosity about their fellow countrymen that they would still pull up a seat and be an audience to this conversation. Uh, And I still believe that to this day. Um, We are at a time where there are thousands of things begging for our attention all the time. I took it as a serious responsibility if on Saturday morning you woke up to see what I had to say, to see what guests I had on this platform I wanted to make sure that you left feeling seen, but also informed. Mm. You learned something that you did not know. Not just for white folks. I wanted black folks to hear, here's what's happening in the API community. Here's what you may not understand. Here's what's happening in the indigenous community. In the indigenous community, I want y'all to understand what's happening in the Latino community. It was a conversation that was needed um, and necessary at the time. And the biggest heartache for me uh, about not having that platform anymore is all of the things that go uncovered. Yes. There is no other platform yes. 
on that network oh. or any major uh, cable you news remind, network remind that addresses those issues. When uh, Rakia Boyd was killed, mm -hmm. and I was like, I want to do something on that. Yeah. And they were like, maybe later. And I'm yeah. like, what do you mean yeah. later? There's no later in this business. Like, That's the you're going to do this now. And I had to fight to say, like, this is this is important. This rises to yeah. the level of one of the top eight stories of the day. Like, come on, we got to do it's this. A, that was and a, nobody else thing. was trying to hear it. Exhausting to have to fight for every single topic. To have to defend and define our humanity every week. I have to say my executive producer was the face of a lot of those fights. And she did the best that she could um, to fight those battles. Because typically they don't like to talk to the talent. Yes. They're like the EPU manager talent. Yeah. Um, and luckily my um, executive producer, uh, a rattler, went to fam you, who's Delta. Your, your she came after you. Okay. But I had okay. known her forever. Okay. Like we had known each other. Um because we, you know, this business is yeah. small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, she reached out and said, hey, I hear you're looking for an EP. I applied. Just want to let you know. Nice. So I was really excited that she joined the team. You weren't fired. <coughs> let me ask you, you weren't fired, right? They did not renew your contract. That's well, different. They took me off the air before my contract was up. They said, you're, we're well, not renewing you your contract. Why did you do a goodbye show? Um, I think that was personal. That's the part that was very personal. Do you think Rashida was trying to hurt your career and say, don't let her do a goodbye show? You know, I cannot speak to her motivations yeah. um, at all. I don't really know her um, that well. I don't know. Where was Caesar at this point? Completely out of it. He, you know, at this point was, was hands off. He was, you know, elevating. Um... So, yeah, he, he was doing his thing. And in terms of um, the, the woman who was president at the time, who, who you just said, she, um, I, I don't know her motivations, but I understood that her affinity was not with my show. It was not with the communities I was speaking to. Um, and it was not with uh, the community I'm a member of. And so, um I did not, again, I did not expect a hyena to act like a lion. What surprised me about it was the attacks that came after. I never spoke ill of the company. I never spoke ill of any individual at the company. Um, I gave a statement that was respectful of my viewers, that we weren't even given the respect of a final show, but I wanted my viewers to know I stand with you. Um, and because there was such an uproar about my show being canceled, um, I think that there were hyenas in the space who felt like, oh, I'm being attacked. Um, and so let me go out and, you know, act a fool and, and, and try to, you know, organize people against this person. But again, um, I never abandoned my community. I didn't show up to this community in crisis because I ain't never left them. Yes. And so when this person shows up like, no, no, I'm a black woman and, and here's what's happening. And it's like, um, there's a difference between black faces and black voices. Mm. And people, what I discovered in that process is Ooh. that people are loyal to power. Some of our civil rights groups are loyal to power. Some of our um, organizers are loyal to money and funding. Um, and so, uh, again, the the streets, the down-home people, the salt-of-the-earth people, I never, ever left them. There's, there's, I mean, you know, there's some value in doing a goodbye show. I did a goodbye show. It was really painful. Yeah. Basically crying the whole time. I mean, the audience would not have known that. Yeah. And at the end, I don't remember what I said, but I said something about, you know, I, I believe in what MSNBC is doing. And I remember other EPs being like, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we went to the office and we cried a lot. Oh. <laughs> we cried a lot. I cried in front of interns. I'm no, like, no, this is no. horrible. But like, you know, I never cried. No. I know, I didn't have a chance no. to. It was a when you whirlwind. Went home? No. Not I was already home. I got yeah. the call when I was at home. Um I never cried. I don't know. I like I immediately just went into like what's next? Um yeah. I was overwhelmed at the outreach. Like I yeah. could not keep up with it. People who I didn't even know I existed. You know, I was yeah. surprised they even knew me um reaching out to tell me what the show meant to them. Um this MSNBC was not um, the whale that swallowed the ship. I was I was the whale, and this is a, a corporate entity. Executives come and go. You yeah, know the yeah, person yeah. who runs the network now 
will likely be irrelevant in a few years. You know, what I was doing was not for my own relevance. I wasn't building a brand. I was building community. Mm. So if your your issue is I am looking out for my own favor in corporate America, um, then bless you and live with this sister. You know, I you a, my work is bigger. You have a lot. You have a you have quite a a warrior spirit. I hope so. They and that's what they want to kill in us, Ray. They want to <laughs> kill our warrior spirit, and that's the thing that you can't do. You can even kill one Tiffany Cross. You can kill a Ray. You can't kill a movement. Well, you that, know, right, 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 right. And it was so right, important right. to me that other people knew: do not be afraid. Speak your mm. truth because they want to make an example out of me. So they know the next person like, hey, when we say go do these 18 segments on Trump, you better do what we say. And I want somebody out there to know, no, I I am the power. I am my face, my brand. This is what makes up this company. If we all say it loudly enough, they can't cancel us all. I don't I don't think that any of the things we've talked about as far as Charlemagne or Tucker is really what it's about. I don't think you made. Well, what is, give me your theory. I, I, I want to know. I don't think you made any mistakes. I think you spat your game. And yeah. These are things that they might call you in the office and say, "Please don't again say that about Florida or whatever yeah. the fuck." But like, so then what happened? What's your theory? I think they needed to make room for Jen Psaki. Really? Yeah. And oh, like, I don't you, know. You you were sitting in her space, and it's like, but she's not in my space. Well, I, they may not have realized at that time, right? Like, it, it, partly. I was told at the executive level, it's an emergency room. There's not a long-term plan. There's not like, well, here's who we're developing. and Here's what we're going to do in six to nine. Like you might think would have. It's constantly hair on fire trying to figure out what to do next. Oh, my God. Mm. And we have this multi-million dollar person who works in the White House who's pretty much a household name. Where are we going to put her? We can't can't put her in primetime because we have, you know, three, four people in primetime we really really like. Uh, Well— it's prime time. It's morning. Well, we're not going to dislodge Joe. So then it's Saturday and Sunday morning. That's the third best hmm. slot, right? Out of at prime time one, morning two, or vice versa. Yeah. And then so weekend morning, right? Other slots are, are you know, not as good, right? Nicole has done a great thing with four o'clock, but yeah. like, that's a trickier spot, right? People are still huh. coming, right? So, you know, we got to make room for this new uh, you know, gigantic figure. What do we do? And so you, nothing, you, That's so to funny. me, I'm like, you did I, nothing. I guess I never looked at her as like this new gigantic figure. So I, I don't know. I, I have never cried about it. I um, am not upset about it. I think a part of me understood that this is always a temporary engagement. And so I was never trying to like, oh, please pick me to host the Today Show one day. You know, it was like, I am here to be my authentic self and uh, be true to my mission. Yeah. And like I said, my mission was to live in service to black folks and yes. fight for the equality and liberation of black folks, which yes. I think benefits everybody, all people of color and white folks. Everybody wins when there's equality. Um, and so I was going to do that for as long as I could to the best of my ability. And um, the second that that partnership between Tiffany Cross, the corporation, and MSNBC, the corporation, didn't work, it ended prematurely and ended before um, I was ready for it to end. And, you know, we were successful. We didn't fail at it. We were successful. Um, But I just thought, well, this part of of my life is over now. This door has closed. Um, What's next? And I will tell you if I can just take over your show for a second. Please, please, bring it. What The day that my show was canceled, the very day that my show was canceled, I had a ton of outreach from everybody. I never felt like, oh, I ain't never going to work again. You know, everybody just kind of rallied around me. Um, The first email I got was from Will Packer, who, of course, you know. Superstar movie producer. His films have grossed more than a billion dollars globally. Um, and black women sit at the the center of that success. Um, I got an email from him that said, Will Packer Productions would love to be in business with Tiffany Cross. Uh, and so I, it was so much happening at the uh, time. I couldn't really respond to all the outreach. That was not my experience of being fired. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Will, um, Will gets it. You know, yeah. he's a family rattler, a man of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. It was up to the Alphas. Are you um, an HBCU? I went to Clark. Oh, I'm yes, not right. Greek. Yeah, yeah. I so, went to Emory. Oh, really? Did is, did Clark, was it Morris Brown or Clark stopped? 
Morris Brown. Morris Brown. That was Morris stopped. Brown. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I was on the yard because mm-hmm. it was like, let's go over there around yeah. noon and see what's up with the girls. Yeah. And it was mostly uh, Spellman, but the five, four campuses four. are mm-hmm. all linked. Yeah. And, you know, the. Well, there's ITC and Morehouse School of Medicine. So technically six. Okay. But the undergraduates. The. I mean the the pride, the, the self esteem, mm-hmm. the sense of self and purpose. Uh, they it was like I mean like I'm blown. I'm just blown away by the body language and yeah. the beauty emanating from all these people. And of course, there's all these amazing sisters. I'm like, I want to get your number, your number, yeah, your yeah. number. But I mean, you know, it's an amazing. Uh, training ground, and I can see, I see some of the warrior spirit that you have connected to Find being a an way HBCU or make person. Way. Yeah, well, yeah, I think the beauty about HBCUs is you are allowed to be yourself, and you're allowed to ask the question, "Who am I?" Mm. Which you think we we answer that all the time, but no, we answer that question in "Who am I in relation to this society, to this world?" Mm. But if we were not uh, an oppressed people. If we were not defined by how they see us, who am I? What do I care about? Who am I not in relation to racism? Yes. Mm. How many of us have the freedom to answer that? So when Black Panther came out and everybody was like, oh, how dope would it be if Wakanda were real? Wakanda is real. I lived in Wakanda. I I got it to Clark Atlanta University. (laughs) Yeah, it's a beautiful experience. Um, And you leave with a bit of culture shock. At least I did. Um... But you, you know, it was it was a journey for me uh, being there around black excellence, black privilege, yes. black princesses, you yes. know, black people who, who were very I was barely I got kicked out of school. Like I could barely afford the tuition there. Like I struggled when I was at Clark. Did you graduate? Um, I didn't. I, I didn't, I didn't either. Not finish. I didn't you didn't. Gra- what, what happened with you at Emory? Well, you know, I was going through a crisis of understanding what we're doing. And I always need to know, like, what are we doing and why? Yeah. And it was like, I I had a lot of friends in the administration and graduate school. And I was like, why do I need the paper? Like, why do I need to finish? Like, if I have acquired enough knowledge, then why don't I just leave? Oh, see, I didn't feel that. And nobody could explain to me, like, this is why you need to finish. Yeah, yeah. So after my junior year, I came to New York and I started working in a restaurant. Yeah. And uh, and then and that was just to be in to be able to be in New York. Yeah. And I'm like going to little media parties. And finally, I'm able to do a little article for the source. I'm able to do a little article for the Village Voice. Yeah. You're scrappy. And, and then I'm able to do a little record review for Rolling Stone. And I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. I, I'm, I have a career, Dad. Yeah. I'm here. And it was like. In retrospect, I'm like, that's not a career. Yeah. Like you wrote three 500-word articles for yeah. three different, but that's not a career. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm in the door. I can't leave. Right, yeah. And I just stayed working in the restaurant for a little while longer and writing, and it kept growing. And then it's like, well, we're doing this now. College yeah. is over. And I could explain to somebody now why you should finish. Yeah. But nobody could articulate it, so I just, so I left. That was not my experience. I very much wanted to. I just didn't have the money. Uh, I left home when I was 16. So I was kind of just out there figuring out my way. I left home when I was 16. Um, you, you, you like, mom, I'm out? Or you ran yeah. away? Or you, no, Well, no, my mom, um, well, she's sober today, but uh-huh. she lost her mother and, you know, had you know, alcoholism was an issue um, in my family. And so I left. So you um, had to leave because the home life was not— It was not stable. It was, it was not given. It was not stable. Yeah. And so yeah. um, when I left, I was an adult way before I was ready. Um, but I, I tell what you— What did you tra- do? Were you, um, you weren't homeless, were you? No, I, like, couch hopped for a while. Semi-homeless? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess so, huh? Yeah, I couch hopped for a while. Um, My first boyfriend— um, Jolyn Martin. I'm gonna say his name because we're still friends to this day. He's one of the few people who saw like he who knew me, like knew me, knew me when I was younger. Um, his family, I was really close with him, and his mom was like, just you know, come stay here. Uh, but I lived on my own for a while, um, like a third floor apartments and just wow. figuring it out. So my father had passed away, so I was able to get his um like SSI, 
you know, benefit. So I had a check every month. I worked at Foot Locker and I was also writing for the local paper. So I had at three 16, jobs 17, at 16, you had years three old. jobs. Yes. And, uh, but you couldn't rent it. How could you rent an apartment? Well, they had these things like third floor apartments where it wasn't like an apartment building, but it was like, like a basement apartment in DC, essentially. Um, and so I was doing that, and, but it was too much for me. And so my, my, at the time, my boyfriend's mother was like, just come stay here. She had to move to Detroit, I think, for work. So I was just in this house by myself. Wait, d- two teenagers living together? No, he was in college. Oh, I was Lord. there by myself. Oh, I was there oh, by oh, myself. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's and not so, bad. No, that's, it, that's, I was that's... completely responsible. I never went anywhere. I did my homework. I studied. I read. Like, I, you know, at 16, I wanted stability. I wanted, like, a normal household. So I was very happy to be, I would cook myself dinner. You know, it was just. And man. out of your family experience, you don't drink at all. I drink quite a bit, actually. <laughs> I did it for a long time, but I, I was probably like but in my thirties before I drank. You waited till you were thirty before you. Drank. I would have a cocktail every now and then, but I was I just wasn't a big drinker. I mean, some people who come out of alcoholic homes and are aware are like, "I know this is my family. Don't touch it because I don't want to." That's go down how I road. felt for a long time yeah. in, in my teen years, in my twenties, like, even with weed. I just felt like you know I was a buzzkill in my like late teens, early twenties. I was a prude, you know. I I was whack, honestly. Like I, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke. I, I don't wasn't, believe that. I wasn't fucking. I was like, <laughs> I in college, I was focused. I'm like, this is what I gotta do. I felt like if I smoke weed today, I'm gonna be doing crack by Friday. Like I can't mess with it. I gotta be focused, and I have no regrets. Like honestly, I wish more people like that is the way it should have been for me. So I didn't really because I was running away from something. I was running away in my mind. From I thought. Home. Bigger is bigger than home. In my mind, I thought the universe had predetermined that success was not for me. Really? And I could only like, undo that, that if I worked really hard and made every single right decision. There was really? no space for a wrong decision. So I can't be fucking around out here with this alcohol. I can't be messing around trying weed because that might get me on heroin. Who knows? I can't be out here having sex that might get me pregnant. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I can't be out here not taking every single opportunity that comes my way because it might be the last opportunity that comes my way. This is before the Internet. okay? this is before people had phones. I used to walk around with hard copies of my resume just to give to people, like give me a chance I can't be out here ill prepared because when opportunity comes a knocking, I want to be ready. I started doing the news for uh, <laughs> in Atlanta for um, V103 okay. morning show. Okay, Frank Ski. Uh, oh, I was, was on his show. Thin. Yes, yeah, lovely guy. I was doing a f- news cuts for Frank Ski morning show. This woman Denise Dunbar was like out sick, and they needed me to do the news. And you cannot tell me I was not Barbara Walters, okay? (laughs) I would treat those news cut-ins with, like, every bit of seriousness. And I was there. I was focused. I I was just a really focused young woman. Yeah. And so it wasn't until I was in my late 20s, probably 28, 29, when I felt like I don't really know who I am because I was running from who I didn't want to be. A failure. Right. And so what if I just relaxed a little bit and decided to be who I am? And at that time, that's when I started settling into myself as a woman. And so then... Which means what? To be free to explore. To say yes to things maybe I wouldn't. To have a cocktail if a I drink, want to. A drink, a pull. If somebody passing a J, like, yeah, okay, I'll pull the J. Let's try it. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the, uh, I was on vacation the first time I smoked. I didn't feel anything. Right. And no, you don't know. You don't you realize it the do. first time. Right, right, right. And then I remember a friend of mine used to smoke all the time. Um, and we smoked together. And I liked the feeling. And I asked him, I was like, hey, can you, um, like, I want to take uh, a J home. And he was like, okay, I'm going to roll you a J, but be careful. This shit steals your ambition. And he gave it to me. <laughs> Unless your ambition is to sit on the couch. Right. <laughs> Sorry, that's the- I was 30 years old. And I, to me, that was an appropriate age where I knew I could manage and navigate. Um, I felt comfortable that it wouldn't lead to addiction um, or unhealthy behaviors. Yeah. So I'm really happy that, you know, my mother um, is an amazing woman. You know, she juggled the struggle as best as she could. And so 
um, had I had like this two parent household that was perfect and everything was fine and they filled out my FAFSA forms and I got to stay at Clark, who's to say that I wouldn't be smoked out somewhere on the court? You know, like my challenging life has me in this seat right now, sitting here talking to you. That ain't a bad way to live. So I don't romanticize some Huxtable type lifestyle. This was the life that was meant for me and I have no regrets. Uh, I think I. I, I wear it like a warrior, I yeah. hope. So yeah. but I wanna tell you, Will, Will hit Tracker. me, yes, and said, Well, we'd love to be in business. And so at this time, um, I have to say at the time everything happening with my show, Angela Rye was like my chief of staff. You could not get to me without talking to Angela. Aww. Like she was just right there with me. Um she's like, Come meet us in Atlanta. I met her in Atlanta, but my whole crew uh, it was a crew of black women in media who just gathered around me. Sonny Hostin yeah, at The View, the Angela View. Ride, Joy Reid, um, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, yes. Alicia Garza, Brit- uh, I said Brittany, Aaron Haynes BLM. at the 19th, Alicia Garza, BLM, uh, founder of Black yes. Lives Matter, Latasha Brown. Like, I was covered. Jamel Hill, Carrie yes. Champion. Yes, ESPN, um, it, yes. We had all been through something similar. So to have yeah. these amazing women wrap arms around me um and, and and you know just say don't fuck with us you know like we we are a, a tight crew and we have your back and and of course I have theirs so I was surrounded with all this love and then to have Will at that time say yeah hey like I'd love to be in business and I always had show ideas you know I had all these ideas and I was like let me get these ideas on paper and like be for real and get this to Will and honestly any project I do I will probably want to do it with Will Packer it is a huge difference to show up to a space where you do not have to defend or define your humanity. Yes. But you are sitting across from somebody who, one, you trust. Yes. I trust Will. Um, two, who understands. He just gets you. You know, yes. like, Will gets me in a way I don't have to understand. His wife and I have the same birthday. So that could be part of it. Literally, we have the same birthday. His beautiful wife, Heather, is born on February 6th. We have the same birthday. Um, but somebody who appreciated your work. Um, understands you and is like, yes. And so I had this idea um, for a show where I would sit because I think black women are oracles and I wanted to sit with a black woman who was old enough to be my mother and a black woman who was young enough to be my daughter. And these two seats would change. I'm the only constant. And we would sit and have a conversation about... Not famous folks. It could be, could be not. It's not celebrity dependent. Right. On our pilot show, we have Dion Warwick. Right. Um... We have Chef Carla Hall. Like, we definitely have some names, but not everybody's going to be famous. Sometimes a black grandma is just an oracle, and she famous just because she a black grandma. Um, and we'll talk about a single issue, like sex, for example. So somebody in their 60s, 70s, 80s has a very different understanding and relationship to sex than somebody who is 25. Yeah, And sure. so um, I'm telling all my business to Ray. I feel so uptight about it. I, I'm sitting here telling a lot of my business now. I didn't even mean to. Uptight about what? I mean, I just say, I talk about my own views on sex, my own experiences, um, because that's one topic. We can also talk about, well, what do you wish you knew about money in your 20s? You know, I'm talking about my finances. Um, We talk about gender roles. You know, like, how do we look at men? Always going to be women. Always Always black women. women. Um, And it's all, like, multi-generation. So it's uh, across generations. You you see what I get there? Across generations. Yeah, you would do a mixed (laughs) woman, right? That's a black woman, right? Yes, that's a black woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you do a trans woman? So this is a question. Um, We have not yet. But you would. I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would. Because yeah, to me, that is a topic yeah, to for talk sure. about. Yeah. You know, our views on trans women in society. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So, yes, stay tuned for that. And, I mean, you know, boomers in particular are, you know, have a very difficult time fully understanding yeah. what's going on with that. We have very honest con- It's completely unfiltered. Uh, I think that that is the point. Are you together? Yes. You're physically in the same room. We are in the same that's room. That's so important. Yeah, I don't like Zooms. No, and no. Do, like it, never To me, same. it works when you're all in the same space, right? When you're in the same space, you can look somebody in the eye. You get their energy. S- right? See you the wouldn't food. got all this out of me over a Zoom? No, 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 <laughs> yeah. no. And I'll, it hasn't come up today, but I will, actually, I'm doing it right now. I am mimicking your, I'm mirroring your body language. Is that right? right? My legs are not crossed, but our hands are the same, right? Right, you... <laughs> And you just moved your head, right? But I, I will yeah. do that. I will mirror your body language, That's sometimes so consciously, sometimes unconsciously, because it makes you feel comfortable. Oh. He gets me, right? You make a joke. I felt comfortable anyway. I have to. No, tell you. we've known each other a long time, but like, like I, I laugh, right? Yeah. You feel comfortable, right? Yeah. You, know, you will never feel more heard yeah. all day 
than talking to me in an interview, right? Because I'm right in person on Zoom. I can't. I can't. It's just different. I it's can't. a different vibe. Yeah. We we create like a living room atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, a part of this is because when I was younger, my grandmother was the matriarch, and I would sit okay. at that table, and she showed me how to. You know, dice peppers and chop onions and what What'd a pinch it is her? and a dash of that grandma. I called her grandma. And she um, would, you know, show me what the consistency of mac and cheese she looked like before you put it in the oven. But during those times, she was teaching me about life and love and grief and joy and childbearing and womanhood and how to be a lady and how to be a woman and everything. Um, and so I so miss her spirit. I so miss that. And when I look at the landscape of young women today, I think, wow, what do grandmas look like now? Because now I'm older. My grandmother has passed. Her generation is 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 dying. Like, what is the 65-year-old grandma, the 70-year-old grandma saying now? And how are 25-year-olds receiving it? How are women my age who are raising 25-year-olds raising their daughters, you know? And so um, this show is something that is about black women. But again, I think everybody should tune in. Men should watch. Have you had a moment watch. where... The two generations are like, no, you are absolutely wrong on almost every show. And like what, like what's something where it's like almost? I mean, obviously everyone's polite. I'll tell you but. one show that we do, um, which you guys will be able to see, is uh, essentially the American Dream because you think about um, like career path. Yeah, and so somebody in your sixties, you are you were raised like, don't give up that good government job and, you know, or you're going to work at this corporation for 10, 15, 25 years, retire. That's what it looks like. A 25-year-old, they're in the gig economy. They might work. They might not. They're going to take a year off. They need to hold space for their, you know, yoga class. And I had a bad day today and I got to center myself and all those things. I'm quite quitting. Right. Because fuck this job. Right. Exactly. I, it is not a badge of honor for me to work 18 hours a day for, for your job. And I, I want a job to appeal to me and my comfort level. And so these two people are very different. And I, the middle, um, where I can understand this older person, and I'm a little envious of this younger person. I want to admonish this younger person, but I'm like, really? You have it more figured out than I do. We you know? grew up with this notion of... How do you have work-life balance? Yes. Right? Especially around women. So many movies, right? And articles around men, it was expected you have no work-life balance. Right. You just go yes. work and your kids would be like, I wish I saw more of my dad. But you, there was a time where, where women could be at home more too. Yes. Like the economy doesn't really lend itself uh, to that but, anymore. But I mean, the next, the younger generation was like, oh, no, no. We'll show you how to have work life yeah, balance. Exactly. You demand it and you stand on business. And exactly. like, I'm leaving. I, who's a brother on TikTok? I love him. Who's like, it's 5 0 I'm leaving. Yeah, exactly. My time is, I gave you my eight hours. Yeah. I'm done. And I'm like, oh, yeah. That's how you do it? Yeah. Oh. So we, we have Discord all the time. Um, we are talking to sex workers. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about an older sex worker who maybe they did porn. Mm -hmm. Maybe they walked the corners. You had a, like a grandma age sex an worker older and, a, sex and a newer worker. one. And then you think about these younger sex workers who they might just be on OnlyFans and they never get touched at all. But they're making 40, 50 grand a month, you know. Um, so the contrast in those two people. Um, in the hip hop industry, we haven't shot this one yet, but we'll have an older hip hop artist and a younger hip hop artist. You know who you're going to have? We know who we're going after. So stay tuned. Okay, okay, Just stay okay. tuned. We're still in conversation. But people who, you know, might look at this young hip hop today, uh, we all turn into those get off my lawn people. Like, you don't know good music, you know? Oof. And so we'll do that in hip hop R&B. Like, there's so, think of all the things that we think of. We look at young people and we're like, y'all don't really know. Those are all the conversations we're having. Um, and I just think it's great because there are older people who don't see themselves reflected. Um, and there are younger people uh, who I think could stand to benefit from the wisdom yeah. of older people. But I have to tell you, sometimes the younger people are giving wisdom as well. Yes. So it's just a sacred space. The yes. magic that happens when we convene and have these conversations. And I would not have been able to do this without Will. Will put his stamp on it. He put his money behind it, his backing. Um, and so this is my baby. This is a project. And I don't have to have permission to talk about this. I don't have to say yeah. this is why this is important. It's yeah. like Will just gets it. Yeah. You know, he just gets it. So and it's you been a this delight. other podcast too. Yes, Native Land Pod. So this is the thing people like to hear me talk politics. Idea? 
This was Angela's idea. Angela, if she were here, she'd say, no, it wasn't. It was Angela Rye's idea. Um, Angela. Um, and you were second in. Yes. So Angela, well, Angela and I are friends, obviously. And so she said, you know, I want to do this podcast. I'm, you know, on this network with Charlemagne at iHeart. And I honestly did not even really think about it. I wasn't like, tell me more. I was just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, okay, sure. Let's do it. I whatever. I mean, you know, Angela's like, let's do a show together. Like, yeah, it, yeah the rest obviously. is fine. Like, whatever, whatever. I don't really know what it is. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be fine. But whatever you didn't say, that works. But you, okay. you, you know her. You know what she's about. I, and it's more importantly, I trust her. Yeah. So it's like, you'll tell me to plan at some point. I don't really know we'll what's be, happening, we'll but be yes. Good. We'll be good. So for the people who, like, I will not talk any politics on Across Generations. On Native Land Pod, um, we talk about politics of the week. We debuted uh, at number one across all Amazing. categories, not just news, but every category on uh, wow. Apple Podcasts, which was great. And um, we've seen success. We're really you know, excited about it. Um, I was surprised about it, to be honest, but Numbers. it shows, yes. We, I mean, I'm still surprised. Like, people show up How did Andrew get passionately. in there? Well, we're all friends with Andrew as well. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunate what um, happened with An Andrew from, you know, the setup to the DLJ and just everything that happened with him because I feel like the world was robbed of his brilliance. And when we talk about candidates like Barack Obama, uh, President Obama, and um, JFK, Andrew had that level of magic. Where it's like, I will walk away from my day job to come and support you. This man on the stump, on the trail, he was, I mean, he had an Obama-type quality to him. Um, and more importantly, he had conviction in his beliefs. Okay. Uh, he was self-possessed in a way that it's like, I believe I can disrupt the system and enact change. Um, and so I was thrilled that he was, you know, up to to come out and join the podcast. And so the three of us... Um, synced up and it's been great. Like we literally every week we are trying to get the podcast shorter because we, we don't have guests on the show. It is just us talking about everything, but it is like a political group chat and we are not scripted. Like we're just yeah. throw us in a room and just, let's just talk about it. Yeah. Um, and so it's been a blast. So the, the people wanting to hear my political takes Native Land drops every Thursday on iHeart. If you just want to hear some good old, like, I just want to hear these, you know, multi-generational black women uh, talk about life. I want to feel like I'm in my grandmother's living room. They can catch me on Across Generations every Tuesday. Um, and that's a project I have with Will Packer. So I'm, this is what I'm telling you. I'm really blessed. Like, I have never been like, oh, man, I don't have my MSNBC show anymore. Like, I'm speaking to a completely different audience. Yeah. Um, and... Thank, I, I am grateful to what I built at MSNBC because I built a loyal enough audience that they will follow me. The network doesn't matter. The audience says we yeah. we fuck with you heavy. Yeah. So we're going to rock with you wherever yeah. you go. Can I curse on this? I've been cursing fuck the whole yeah. time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a little late to ask, but I hell know. yeah, hell yeah. No, I'm like, y'all got a bleep button. So. <laughs> no, no, bring it, bring it. <coughs> you going to edit out all this coughing the and everything? The coughing for sure. Thank and the, you. And the discussion of the coffee. Okay, yeah, so thank you. It's not that much. <laughs> um, wow. Well, what else do you want to do? I don't know. I, you know, I do. That's a lie. I do know. I would like to host a morning show. Okay. Um, I don't know where, you know. Okay. Like um, on TV? Yes. I am a TV person. I'm enjoying podcasting, but I'm definitely a TV. I'm an in front of the camera person. Um, but I'd like to host a morning show because it's like when we get up in the morning, what we watch is usually by default. It's yeah. like, I don't like this. I'm hate watching. Or this doesn't really speak to me, but I'm watching so I can post about how it annoys me or I can talk to my friends about how this annoyed me. I would like for us to have something every morning to start our day with. And it's like, yes, these are the things that I want to know. These are the things that I need to know. Do we still watch television like that? L yes. Like I wake up and look at a morning show rather than when I have time to watch television, I DVR or whatever. A show yeah, that I like. I think people are still waking up watching something. Okay. Um, or maybe they're listening to something, but I think people are still waking up watching television. Um like with your podcast, you can find them whenever, wherever. This this is my right? point. If you're on at nine, you gotta yeah. fuck with me at nine or 
that that is so the viewing habits. I don't think anybody can really tell us where this industry is going yeah. in media. You know, yeah. we're all figuring it out. But the viewing habits of people we do know, they want it at their fingertips when they want it, whenever they want it. Yeah. If I wake up at two in the morning, I want to be able to tap in and, you know, stream something. If I am up at noon, if my morning TV for me is noon, I want to be able to watch my morning TV yeah. at noon. Yeah. Um, so maybe it is an issue of it's not really on, you know, linear television. Maybe it's a streaming outlet. Maybe it's YouTube TV. YouTube TV has more. TV. Uh, I'm the, late to it. No. Like it has more for the first time cord cutters, the people who are getting rid of yeah. cable. Um, it was neck and neck at the end of last year with people who had cable and those who don't. Right. So you know what's going to happen next. Right. It's going to tilt. There right. will be more people without cable yeah. than with cable. So this whole idea that cable, not only cable, but cable news is a giant in content creation is just a very antiquated notion. That is not where well, audiences are, gather Are, are we making a differentiation between like, you know, you and I watch a lot of probably Max, right? It used to be HBO, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, you don't watch MSNBC. You don't watch CNN, right? But I'll, I watch CNN in the morning sometimes, yeah, like but I'll turn I get on frustrated CNN. by it, you know? Right. I'll still watch MSNBC. I mean, like, am I not, are we not watching cable by another delivery means? Like, does it matter? that it, What do you that, mean? Like, if I watch cable via YouTube TV, I have technically cut the cord. Mm-hmm. But I'm still watching Max, Netflix, yeah, I see what MSNBC. You're like, yeah, I think we've seen the decline in those numbers. Now we're in an election cycle this year. Then it's different this right? Right. So we'll have to see like where it settles, and that always happens. But it's it's typically like this. Are you not afraid for the future, the direction of the country? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have I given you the impression no. that I wasn't afraid? No, you've not. I, I yes, I'm very afraid. But what I know about us is we are a resilient people. This, Americans or black people? Black people. Okay. Black people so are we'll, resilient we'll people. Make it. We will make it. We will survive. Now, that doesn't mean it's not without a fight. That doesn't mean we're not going to get bruised. We should all act like we're in a fight for our lives because we really are. But we have survived much worse. Um, and we can survive whatever. We're not so loyal um, to this democracy. Um, but we are loyal to ourselves in the sense that we will live. We we will we will live. Your your optimism and positivity is um, inspiring because I know it's not rooted in everything's gonna be fine. But like the the warrior ness of you of like we'll you know like if we have a problem we'll just fight and make it better. And that's I, what we've always done. And I appreciate the optimism rooted in that. As opposed to, it'll just work out. No, we, that, well, you know, we that, don't that, have that, that uh, kind of that some yeah. other people come to the table with. Yeah, I I think that's what's unique about us. Um, even when the the country is doing well, we are typically still in a fight. Yes, for sure. Like you look at the person who lives well below the poverty line, who lives in the PJs, whose mama lived in the PJs, who raising kids in the PJs. And across multiple administrations, they've been told something is going to get better for you. The change is going to happen next year for you. And they keep surviving. They keep living. They mm. keep doing the best that they can. Mm. And you want to tell them the world is on fire, but you got to come help save America. Of course, these people like, if you don't get the fuck out of my face with that, like I'm here trying to survive, you know, like I'm here working this job. I'm raising these kids. I'm trying to take care of my mother who's in the hospital. My father passed away last year. I still got to go through insurance papers. I, you know, I don't have time for that. Like, I, I'm going to survive. Think, Our every day is a fight. I think I think this was a line in the new Jim Crow, but it might have been somewhere else, where part of why there's recidivism is because for many people, they go to prison and they're like, oh, I can do this. Yeah. And then they're not so afraid of going to prison. Yeah. And I feel like in a way that is like Trump, like for a lot of people, like, well, we did it before. Yeah. You know, and I'm not talking about MAGA. I'm talking about like middle. Ronald you know, Reagan. You know, the, the, about George the, Bush. the fringe of Dems who can like see that ideologically. They're like, yeah. well, I mean, you know, it's, we don't like in 2016 is like, you know, our hair is on fire because that would be the end of America. Yeah. This time, a lot of people are like, eh, this is unfortunate. 
It's yes. unfortunate yes. because um, a second term of Trump, an unhinged lunatic who is not worried about running for re-election uh, would be frightening not because just to America not, but to the globe. Because he's not going to abdicate. <laughs> well, yeah. There, there, well, there's but, one part of it, which is, you know, will he um, have a peaceful transition of power? That's definitely one part of it. But the other part of it um, is the existential threat he represents to the global structure that we know now. And I think a lot of people haven't paid enough attention um, to the shift that's happening already. All empires fall. There's always going to be a shift in superpowers. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at now in the West, I don't know that the West will continue to have a stronghold on who's the superpower. The global South is rising. There's you, a whole different you shift think happening. We are witnessing the end of America being a potentially the global leader. Potentially, yeah, absolutely. Driven by Trump and the changes that he's making. Driven by the dumbing down of the American body politic, but also just the global shift happening um, in terms of GDP and what different nations have to offer uh, in terms of alliance building. Um, it sent a message when you saw President Xi and President Putin hold hands on a global stage. That's a message that should frighten people. Um, I don't know with the decreasing reliance on oil what this means for the Saudis and the global south, but they they are light years ahead of us. They're not focused on American politics. They don't give a shit about Republican, Democrat. Like they are looking, they're playing a completely different game. It's like we're still playing checkers. They're playing chess. Um, when you think about the coalition of the willing that you that was once like a big deal, is is France a big deal now? I don't know. You know. Um, I, I think where there is saving grace is the U.S. military budget swallows whole the rest of the world combined. Yeah. Our military power is— But we've the, see, but specifically within the last 10, 20 years, we've seen the limits of that and how often a small local insurgent force can hold off or defeat a much larger, better army. We have never seen that army. happen with the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army has not engaged. We have sent weaponry to countries like Ukraine. You have never seen the American military to date defeated because we, we have not had engagement. Well, you know. I mean, like recent, like in, the, in our recently? lifetime. I mean, oh God, I mean, because you think about weaponry in Vietnam versus what we see today. Now, I mean, warfare looks completely different than it did in the 60s. Now, and you're, 70s. now you're now you're pressing me. I bet people in the audience are yelling out names. I'm thinking. I mean, well, obviously, we think about Russia and Afghanistan. Um, my God, I mean, like, I mean, what Israel is going through right now, like they, they, they are not able to militarily defeat these, these people, who, right? I mean, who is not able to defeat Israel them? is not able to militarily defeat who Gaza, the Palestinians, like they're like, they, this has been going Israel on for Israel is a months. nuclear power. Of course they are. No, no, no. I mean, well, they can't drop a nuclear bomb on They can't. Gaza. So this is the, so this is the nuanced part of this discussion, um, and Israel right now, as horrific as we've seen the the act actions of the IDF, um, they are not an unchecked power at this point. I know people feel like they're doing like horrific things. I agree. It's it's horrific what we're witnessing. There is still some checks and balances with the not enough, but with the U.S. So imagine if the U.S. was, was like, you know what, we we out. Y'all do what you want. That as awful happened. as we've seen now, it it would still get 10,000 times worse. So I would not say that they're not able to militarily defeat um, Gaza. Of course, they like it's not a war. You know, no, there not, is no, no conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, a huge superpower crushing yeah. a people that yeah. we're witnessing. That's not military engagement. That's okay. not what I'm talking about. Okay. I think military engagement is what you see happening with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Russia has not been able to militarily defeat the Ukrainian army. Yeah. That's an example. Yeah. The U.S., our army, uh, our armed forces, I would say are pretty um, impenetrable. I, I don't know of a military that could threaten us as a superpower today, just speaking from a military power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you a question. I, um, because I have seen your interviews, uh, and I have an interview that you did that I really enjoyed. Um, it's this actress who everybody knows, like everybody loves her and knows her personally. People just love her. I did not know who she was, but I saw her in your interview. I'm like, I just love this woman. 
Brisha Webb. Yes. She is so, I don't even know her, but I'm like, I just love your personality. So that was one of your interviews that I saw that I really enjoyed. But who has been your favorite interview so far? That's a great question. I I, I can't say one. Who has been your favorite interview (laughs) so far? Tiffany Cross. Oh my God, are you kidding? Thank you so much. (laughs) Favorite interview (laughs) of so far. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I was getting to, it's hard to say, but it's you. Thank you. That's what I was going to after me. Say, after you. Who would you it's say? Hard, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, like, Are they going to be your least favorite? Oh, my God. My <laughs> least, my least, the least favorite you'll never hear because we threw it in the tr- Oh, wow. Um, my God. Um, like, give me something. Who's been the biggest asshole like you had to deal with? Well, nobody... Nobody's been an asshole on this show. I mean, like, if you come here, yeah. you want to be part of this. Yeah. I mean, you know, that that... That I don't think about. I mean, like, you know, Zadie Smith was a dream. Oh, nice. You know, that was such an amazing conversation. And you how know, do you know Brisha? Because it seemed like you guys knew each other. She was on the show once before during quarantine. Okay. Through Zoom, so there was a vibe there. Is she just as lovely as she seems? Yes, she is yeah. a she's a performer. She's a comedian. She is so funny. She's, is she a legit comedian? Like, does she do stand up? Don't have me lying. Okay, I don't, all right. I don't think she does stand up, but like she is a comedic actress. Okay. Yeah. So like she's funny and like she's like funny vibe. Like she yeah. could read the phone book and you'd be in hysterics. So like just sit her down. I mean, like even if you didn't, she didn't know you. Yeah. She would do the thing and charm you and have you laughing. And the moment that people talk about, she was doing impressions and she was doing like. 30 to 60 second impressions of different singers. And I think there was a conversation about she did Anita Baker and her friend was like, oh, that's Tony Braxton. And it was like, they do sound they similar, do. Yeah. right? It is a deeper register for a woman that's that. But then when she did Rihanna as a millisecond impression, yeah. I thought that was so hysterical and yeah. so brilliant. Was that funny. it's like, I don't need to do two minutes of Rihanna, like right. one second of it, you'll hear it. And yeah. I was like, oh, that was brilliant. She is you funny. Know. She is hilarious. Uh, I mean, Tony Braxton, it's a fantastic interview. Oh, I remember her talking about, yeah, you know, we went to David's house to to record, David Foster, to record Unbreak My Heart. And I did it once. And then you sang it through one. Yeah. Like the court, yeah. And then yeah. we did it once more because Diane Warren came just to do it for her. And then we went to Nobu. But the second take, we didn't use you. You saying it? Well, yeah, I'm a church kid. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. You know, but like I was, she was not considered the best singer in her family wow. before. Yeah, of course. Like 18, 19 years. Like I'm like, that's insane. Oh, can I tell you? That's Please. another show we're doing. Please. Um, reality TV, an older reality TV star and a younger reality TV star okay. on our cross generations. Because, okay. you know, you and I grew up on real world. Yeah. But real for world sure. was constructive. You know, like they had jobs, they were like having them work at a community center, yes. or they were all doing something. Yes. They, yes. And now cut to get them drunk in a house. Yes. And let them. Yeah. <laughs> ah, go it's nuts. Pretty, I, I hate it. So um, that's another one. You made me think about that when you were talking about Tony Braxton. No, no, for sure. I mean, so many great ones. What else comes to mind? I mean, well, who? Um, oh, if you could go back to MSNBC, would you? Yeah, you would. Yeah, you'd like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was, that. I, I was an MSNBC watcher before. Yeah, you know. I mean, um, I I would I would approach it differently. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, we got kicked out. During the presidential campaign, and I either I said it or I was I was because we would do like a monologue, like an essay at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. And either I said it or I was about to say it. And then we got dumped because it happened fairly quickly. We like knew like we hear rumblings like shit is happening. You can hear stuff, but we're okay, Right. I don't know. But and I think it was like on Thursday, I I think I remember Thursday they called me like. So tomorrow's the last show. It's like, oh fuck off. And um one of the one of the one of the co-hosts didn't want to do the last show and was like, I'm not gonna show up. And I went to their house at like eight, nine o'clock at night. I'm like, you have to come. You can't not 
be there because yeah. I mean, like, I'm upset. We're all upset, but like, you can't, you can't not do it. Um, and of course, everybody they did it. Everybody did it. Um, Interesting. Um, yeah, I would do it differently. And like some of the things we've talked about, I would. I, I was ramping up to say I am not doing horse race. I am not doing theater. I am going to talk about issues throughout this presidential campaign. Yeah. I remember we covered, we were on when Obama debated Romney, right? So the reelection of Obama. Mm -hmm. First debate in Denver, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Romney was like, he'd had the first uh, snort or Coca-Cola of his life, right? He was like super animated. And Barack was like, you know, like, Professorial, uh, professorial, and, yeah. and like, like not used to the trail, rusty. So he was like laid back, cool, like yeah. yeah. But he, everything that Barack said was true to what he had done and what he believed and mm -hmm. what he was going to do. And nearly everything Romney said was a lie about what he believed or what he was going to do. Mm. So I'm like, well, was this the binders full of women debate or was that the next one? I, I I think that was the second debate. Yeah, because the second debate was a different president different, Obama. Different, different yeah. Obama, different Obama. But, yeah. you know, we come in the next day and I'm like, well, clearly Obama won the debate because Romney just lied the whole night. And everyone else is like, you can't say, like, you are so far off the path yeah. to say Obama won that. You can't be one out of 99, Yeah, you know, and especially because you're black. So it looked like you're just a homer. Like, you're just so supporting crazy. him because he's black. And... So what I was really thinking about was like, because that's just theater. Romney's just winning on theater, right? Yeah. He's up and Obama's low energy. And like, so he wins because he's like, that's not like none of the debate conversation has anything to do with being in the White House. Nobody yeah. will ever run in and say, you have to decide what to do in this complex geopolitical issue in 30 seconds go. Like that will never, ever happen. Yeah. So the debate is a poor test for who should become president. But that we talk about it around theater and not even what they're saying. I'm like this. So I was going to say and going to challenge myself to do. I'm like, I'm never talking about theater. I'm never talking about yeah. tone for you. and alpha and body language. I'm talking about like ideas and policies yeah. and what they're talking about they're going to do for the country. Um, I This is to you. Go back. I would not go back to MSNBC. I, you know, I just why? was like, it's just, I did it. You know, like, yeah. why would I? It doesn't, I, I'm doing a whole new thing now. I have a new audience. It just feels like that time has passed. I, but I have another question for you. This is yeah. one that's more random. Yeah. You can include this or not. But this is more of a philosophical. Okay. It's about dating. Oh, let's do it. So, in I, dating. I haven't dated in like 20 years. No, but you, but you might still have an opinion on this. Because I've been having this discussion with people. And I'm just really curious. Do you have a boyfriend? I am single and dating. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Best of luck. With that and everything <laughs> Well, what would you tell me about marriage? What's your advice? You recommend it? I'll tell you one thing for sure. Um, uh, I mean, I've actually seen a lot of, of conversation data about how marriage is good for men and not so good for women. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and that may redound more to what happens when you have children, mm -hmm. um, which— no matter how hard you try, the man can never do 50%. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Especially when they're babies. But even as they get older, like, there's a, a connection and attraction yeah. to mom. When you fall, you don't scream for daddy. You don't. You scream for mommy. You, you, right. You know. So, if um, mommy's there, unless yeah. you're a single dad. So it's yeah. a lot. That adds a lot to mom's plate. Yeah. Um, but I remember my parents were married for, like, 50 years or something like that. Like, you know, and, and it ended when my father passed away. So they were like, you know, together forever. And the thing that I think really worked is they had a sort of amnesia mm -hmm. of like, you know, don't hold on to baggage. Don't hold yeah. on to being mad. Like you might let the other person say, I was really upset when you did X and then they let it go and yeah. they move on. And I remember even like later in my father's life, we were at dinner, I think we were at Outback steakhouse and he said something that annoyed her and she kind of you know like had a little annoyed face and like you know might have huffed a little bit and then she kind of like you know like breathed and like let it go and yeah. and, you know, and it wasn't like well i'm gonna do something back and like you know just let it go and we just moved on and if you can do that have amnesia and not cling to 
Yeah. She said this. He said that. I'm still mad at the thing you said four years ago or the thing you didn't do three years ago. Like, if you can do that, you can have, I think, more happiness. Like, I like you as a person. I yeah. like you to your core. I love you. You're going to make some mistakes. Can you allow me to have the grace to make mistakes? And we all move on. Yeah. Well, Latanya Richardson, uh, Samuel Jackson's wife, talks about that, about what made her marriage work. And she says it's a lot of forgiveness and a lot of amnesia. <laughs> she said that? <laughs> yes. She used that word? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. So you're, huh. you're, you're on to something with that. Well, thank you so much. Thank You're you for so having wonderful. me. This, this is, is like a podcast, therapy, a catch up session, yeah. all of it. This is yeah. exciting. This yeah. is exciting. Tell Brisha she was my favorite interview. Oh. <laughs> thanks so much to Tiffany for a great interview. And thanks to you for listening. 